Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NCTA TEA um, webinar on the current state of Uyghurs and Kazakhs in China with our guest, Dr. Sarah Tynan from the University of Colorado. Um, we are very fortunate to have her um, participating with us today. So I'm just going to go through a few um, slides, introduce NCTA and TEA to you, and then turn it over um, to her. The program for teaching East Asia at the University of Colorado Boulder um, has been, or the TEA itself, has been a program since 1985, conducting professional development programs for K-12 teachers, curriculum development projects, and is funded with private foundation money and US government grants as well. The National Consortium for Teaching About Asia um, is also part of our initiative and TEA is one of the seven national coordinating sites for NCTA. Um, it's a national initiative and it provides professional development about East Asia for K-12 teachers. Our programs are online and face-to-face -face in cities all around the nation during the school year. And normally during this time, we'd be preparing for our summer institute in Boulder, um, but we have all been kind of pushed to be working remotely from our home. So I am talking to you from my house and Sarah um, is at her house and we are bringing you programming now in a new way. We do have online courses book discussions, seminars, film discussions, um, and you can see our two websites at the bottom there. Sarah Tynan holds a PhD in human geography from the University of Colorado Boulder. She lived in China for a total of five years from 2009 to 2017. Her research focuses on state building nationalism and ethnic conflict in Asia. She's trained in political geography. She studies the invisible violence in China's governance of its minority borderlands. Today, she's the graduate program manager at CU Boulder with the goal to enhance graduate student life, diversity, inclusion, and community. We will, um, Sarah is gonna, pres uh, Dr. Tynan is gonna present her webinar to us, and at the end, we'll have a chance to ask questions. If you have questions, please list them in the chat, and I will bring them forward at the end um, to Dr. Tynan. So I am going to unshare my screen, and then Dr. Tynan will put up her um, PowerPoint. Okay, are we ready for me to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, welcome to this webinar, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, like Lynn said, my name is Sarah, and uh, I'm really excited to hear your questions. We'll have plenty of time for questions after. Uh, so please feel free uh, to ask me questions about anything related to my talk or uh, the, the program TEA because uh, it's uh, especially uh, meaningful to me to be presenting for uh, teaching on East Asia because my high school teacher, Cindy McNulty, who I believe is in the audience with us today, uh, was my high school teacher. And she has worked with um, 
teaching East Asia for a very long time. And she was basically the main influence for me to go to China for the first time and to learn Chinese. She had a big impact on me and she also had a big impact on the subject that I study, uh, Uyghurs, because she uh, showed us pictures of her own travels to, to, to Tibet and to Xinjiang when we were in high school. And it was a really big influence on deciding what I ended up doing. And um, so if you also have any questions about being a high school teacher, in turn, I can give you my perspective that I remember from being a high school student and having a teacher teach about Asia and what that meant for me. I can say that, you know, I've been reflecting on it today, what I'm going to say, and I've just been thinking about I was just such a jerk in high school and I was really self-absorbed and you know a lot of the things that my teacher Cindy McNulty had us do I was like oh you know it's just for extra credit whatever but it had a huge impact so even if your students you know your your students are teenagers even if they act like jerks they are listening I still remember the field trip that um, Cindy took us on to the mosque and we were able to talk to, I remember talking to girls that were my age and this was right after September 11th. So it was really impactful to have a teacher like that who showed us different perspectives on the world. And um, even though I act, I might have acted like I didn't care that much. Um, it really, really was quite profound. So I welcome any questions you have about um, high school. Being a high school student, I can't speak to the professional aspects of pedagogy or curriculum or anything like that, but I can, I can share a little bit more about that after. So why are we here today talking about this issue? <laughs> um, ultimately, my goal for all of you is to bring back a sense of the diversity in China to incorporate into your curriculum back home. So I do hope that that's kind of my life goal is that um, more college and high school courses don't just teach one vision of China, but they show the stories from Tibet. They show the stories from Xinjiang, from Inner Mongolia, from the Korean areas, from the different diverse places in China. And they don't just present it as one country, but they present all of the diversity of China. China has 55 ethnic minorities. And I do hope that in the future, more high school teachers can bring this other perspective on China into the classroom. Um, so that's kind of my goal today. And I'll just show you a little bit about my research in that region. Uh, this picture that we're looking at right now is a picture that I took out of my kitchen window when I was living in Xinjiang. This is a picture of Urumqi, uh, a city of about 4 million people in Western China. So it's a large metropolis. Um, along the edges of the Tian Shan Mountains that you see in the distance, right on the edges of the Taklamakan Desert. Sorry. My mom is calling me. <laughs> So it was a large city uh, that I was living in, but very far from the rest of China. <laughs> now I do have this brief uh, mention of solidarity with the black community. I think we all know what's going on, but I have some links to resources here. So I will share the PowerPoint um, afterwards and everyone can have access to the PowerPoint. I know not all of you are located in Colorado. This is just some Colorado based resources, but I hope some of you can explore some of these things that are going on um, in our own community. I think that um, the, the conversation that we're going to be talking about today, I've already mentioned diversity, but what it really comes down to is race and difference. So I hope everyone can um, think critically about how the conversation today is related to our own racial conversations in our own country, because 
um, that is also one way we can get our students more involved in these conversations is to show how this is connected to the United States. This isn't just some faraway place called Xinjiang in China, but it's connected to the ways we see race all around the world in colonization as well. So the outline for today, first of all, we'll talk about who are the Uyghurs. Um, just a little bit more of a background. Uh, second, <clears throat> I'll share with you some of my research in terms of what is the current situation on the ground. And then we'll try to talk about how, how can you incorporate this into your curriculum back home. Some of you may have seen these kinds of headlines in the newspapers recently. Well, maybe not recently, probably not since March because we've only been talking about one thing, two things since March. But before then, um, these were kind of the headlines that were coming out. There was a lot of news about the mass incarceration of the Uyghur people. So I'll give you some background on that today. What, what does all of this mean and how did this come about? These are the headlines from uh, The Economist, the year that I went to China for the first time, 2009. There were headlines like this in the paper. And if you look closely, this is actually quite problematic. Um, <clears throat> first, um, Kind of similar to the situation that's going on in the United States right now. They were categorized as racial killings in a repressed and dangerous province. This kind of narrative has plagued Xinjiang to be this dangerous place, this um, rebellious province. Um, you know, is China framed? That, first of all, that already assumes. It, it's making an assumption about China being a unified nation state to begin with, but that's an assumption. Um, and, and the reality is, is that it's actually much more complex than a simplified newspaper story would, would present. But this was what was going on the summer before I arrived in China. And this is part of the, part, one of the reasons why I got interested in the issue. Because when I arrived in China, this had, these riots had just happened. And um, about 600 people were killed. The Chinese military opened fire on a crowd of peaceful protesters. And that's what set off the riots originally in China. Um, it almost sounds too familiar to what's happening right now in the United States. Um, it's kind of scary, actually. But... Um, when I got to China, there were a lot of rumors going around about the Uyghur people, who they were. And I remember very clearly one of the things that my host family told me. I was living with a Chinese host family. One of the things they told me was, I was in Eastern China at that time. One of the things they told me was, oh, Xinjiang is dangerous don't go there. Whatever you do, don't go there. You will get, um, they, they will stick you with a syringe full of HIV. And this was an actual rumor that was going on at the time. And if you, if you look it up, there's, um, there's newspapers about it. There were several Uyghur people who were convicted and sentenced to prison for supposedly having these syringes full of HIV, HIV. I don't know if it's true or not, but I was immediately skeptical because I knew then there's no way that an entire group of people in an entire province can be dangerous. And I was, my curiosity was immediately piqued. So I learned a little bit more about the region on my own. Like I said, I had learned a little bit about it from Cindy McNulty's class, but I did some more research on it. So this is the region we're talking about. It's called Xinjiang. It's here in the pink, the pink uh, province here. And what this map is specifically showing is this new Silk Road economic belt that's being 
built right now um, that's going to connect China to Europe. And it's, it's both roads, railroads, gas pipelines that is going to cross the continent, the Eurasian continent. And Xinjiang sits in the middle of these. So this, is, this map kind of shows you one reason why this is happening right now. Because Xinjiang is such a key economic player for China, partially because it has a lot of oil and partially because it's at the crossroads of this new economic trade zone and center. Um, and so it's, it's a really important strategic point for China and it serves as a, you know, if you, if you think about the ancient geopolitical battles, it serves as a buffer between China and Russia. It serves as a buffer between China and, and other, you know, the former Soviet Union, that was a big thing um, during the Cold War and such. So, and the Sino-Soviet split, and we can talk more about that later maybe, but anyway. So, um, so this is really a, a key, a key uh, part of of the story. But I do argue that it's more complicated than simply economics, right? There's something more going on. And a lot of it has to do with racial categories that people are put into. So what was this place like? I showed you a picture of the skyline. It's beautiful um, in a large city. Um, but this picture kind of gives you an idea of the diversity of this place. Um, if you look at the photo, you can see we, there's Russian, Chinese, of course, here, um, Uyghur, which is written in the Arabic alphabet. You can see the Chinese flag here. Um, uh, this is Uyghur here, um, as well as English, tea and coffee over here. Um, Sabit Usta is Turkish. So it was an extremely diverse city in, in um, it was a very cosmopolitan city. There were people from all over the world there, but especially um, Turkic people from Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, mostly some Uzbeks as well, and um, Russians as well as um, people from all over the world. So the Uyghur people um, are uh, Muslim people, they are a Turkic people, so they, they speak a language very similar to Uzbek, and they are Muslim. They share a lot of traditions with uh, Turkish, with Turkish music, Turkish art, uh, things like that. They, they um, some would argue, my self included, <laughs> that they have been colonized by the Chinese. So uh, what did I do? Well, I, uh, I had lived in China, as I mentioned, I went to China for the first time in 2009. I lived in China for a couple of years. Um, and then in 2014, I was uh, granted some grant money from the National Science Foundation to do more research on this region. So I went there and I learned Uyghur. It's a beautiful language. And um, it's very, as I said, it's similar to Uzbek, but it's a Turkic language um, and, and it uses the Arabic alphabet. But once you get the hang of it, it's just like any other language. And I became friends with my neighbors. I immersed myself into the community as much as I could. And this meant sharing meals, holidays, weddings, celebrations, as well as just everyday life. Um, with many people to learn more about this place. What does it mean to be a minority in China today? And what I found was beautiful. They have a rich culture dedicated to guesting and hosting to their Islamic faith, to arts, to family, and to homeland. But what I also found was heartbreaking as well. Starting in 2016, uh, the policing increased dramatically. 
And police stations like the one you see here, as you can see, we've got the police station in the foreground. The, on top of every police station was the Chinese flag, marking an important marker of national identity is always the flag. If you look closely here, the police stations were also decorated in a type of Uyghur art called Atlas. You can, it's kind of blurry, but I thought that was kind of an ironic, but also exoticized in an objectified way to put Uyghur art and culture on a police station. It was kind of horrifying. But um, we have the police station in the foreground. You can also see the surveillance cameras here. These surveillance cameras covered pretty much every square inch of the city. And in the background, you can see traditional Islamic architecture, including the crescents on top. And other, some other um, important Islamic architecture as well. So this was common to see this kind of mix of Chinese presence, Chinese national security presence, really, side by side, um, Islam and mosques. But as the year went on, these police stations started reproducing like cockroaches. It was horrible. They, there was literally a police station on every single block. You could, the idea was, you know, on college campuses, they have the blue light system where the idea is that you're supposed to be able to see a blue light anywhere you go. That was the idea with the police stations, except it was police stations, not blue lights. So there was... It was the idea was that anywhere you went, you would be able to see a police station, and it was, it was quite literally like that. Um, and I just remember taking this picture because I was walking down the street one day, and I was like, "Well, there's another police station." Um, and what ended up happening was, and what I found in my research, is that poor minorities were more likely to get picked up for small offenses than anybody else. And such small offenses were things like not carrying your ID. That could be reason for arrest. There were other things too, um, including having a picture of a mosque on your phone, for example, could be reason for arrest. And they would have police officers patrolling the street, checking your phone. And you had no choice. I had to do it too. People would just stop me, ask for my ID, and ask to have my phone, and demand my password. I mean, there's nothing you can do. You have to give them your phone password, and they would they would look through your your phone and everything. So, it was quite scary to have that search and seizure, that sense of security that we take for granted. This, you know, when I say we, I mean. I am speaking as a white person here. I think other people of color in the United States might have a different experience, but the, this, this, you know, this right to lawful search and seizure violated was, was quite alarming, but this was, I only had a taste of it. I mean, I was an American, so I walked around with a certain level of privilege in some ways. And um, I think the Uyghur people had had a much harder time with it. So one of the things that, was characteristic of this total control over the city. It was not just the police. It was also a system of bureaucracy. And um, I just have this ex these two examples of a registration form. And if you look closely, you can see, I don't know how they just have my middle name, Elizabeth, here written here, you can see, but this is mine. Oh yeah, you can see my name down here. Tyne and Sarah Elizabeth. I'm a woman, here's my passport number. Megua, this is, this is saying that I'm from America. And then it says, um, what's your family relationship basically? And it says I'm like a single person. So I'm showing you this because this is as, you, as I have the translation up here, floating population allowance to inhabit notification. I'm sorry, it's a terrible translation, but what I'm trying to communicate here is that every person that was a floating population, meaning that they were not born in the city, so they had moved to the city later in life and they didn't own a house in the city, 
they had to register with the police station. And then once you registered your, all of your information, your photo, your phone number, everything was put into this large database. And then the police would come by and, and check the home and see if, if you were registered correctly. And so they would come, this is a picture of my door. They would come and scan this QR code and then all, all of your information in this database would be pulled up immediately. And then they would kind of check and make sure that you were properly registered in the home. So first of all, this was a system of complicated and confusing bureaucracy as a way to prevent poor migrants from moving to the city. Why? To make space for Han people, basically, because this was specifically only for Uyghur people. Yes, Han migrants did have to register, but they didn't have this complicated surveillance system associated with them. Why? Because Uyghurs are poor and they're Muslim. So there is already this narrative of fear, but then also there's this sense that they're taking our jobs, this kind of thing. So this was a way to systematically prevent more people from accessing resources of the city, meaning jobs. And then the second thing was this laid the foundation for establishing a surveillance network and a database to collect information about the minority, specifically poor minorities in the city. Rich minorities were not subject to this kind of situation. This is poor minorities were subject to this. Establish a system to track minorities so that they could later very quickly and systematically identify them, come to their homes, arrest them, and put them into concentration camps. And that is what happened. So all of these terrible things were happening and it was quite scary and it quite reminiscent of the Holocaust. However, I do want to emphasize that amidst all of this oppression and incarceration um, there was a lot of culture still to be seen still to be treasured and and cherished so this is a picture of a curtain market curtains were one way that Uyghurs decorated their homes as a way to show their cultural affinity with the Turkish world and as a way to have a colorful decorated home. This was really important to them. And I also just want to point out a couple of things, partially because I'm a geographer and I like to study space, but there are multiple scales of space here. First, we have the mosque in the background, clearly an Islamic space and a Uyghur space. You can see this construction crane in the background as well. Um, and this kind of symbolized, well, it didn't symbolize, it was a material reality of Chinese construction going on. This is from, a, from the subway construction. They were building a subway station there. Um, and then in the background, we also have state territory. This was a government building. And then we have this space of the market, which was a clearly the Gore space. Um, I'm so sorry, they're mowing the lawn in my backyard, so hopefully you guys can stop with me. Um, I'll put the microphone close to my mouth. So, um, and then we also have the space of the body, which was a very important part of Uyghur sovereignty. You can also see the Uyghur out put that here. You can see on this sign there's no Chinese translation. This market was for Uyghurs by Uyghurs. There was no, not even an attempt to market to Chinese people. Um, but we also have the sovereignty of the body here, the space of the body. We have a Uyghur man with a hat. Another one, these are clearly, the shepka is um, kind of a Russian hat, I guess, slash European hat, but this was something that a lot of Uyghur men wore. And then the dopa, 
was another specific hat that men wore. And then you can see all of these women here and this one in the foreground as well um, have a headscarf on. So these types of Uyghur culture were really important to people. And from this balcony, so if you walk up these steps here, these steps here, which I did, I took the next picture from this balcony. This was the space of the market. And this was a very, as you can see, all of the women have their head covered. And um, they are sitting on bags of, of merchandise for sale. This was a type of informal market. And the police did come the police did come and try to clear this market out as they did frequently. And here is a picture of the same market. So the picture I'm about to show you is a couple months later, but it is of the same market after the police have come to clear it out. So this would happen frequently and um, the police would, would come and clear the market out now. Of course, that was terrible, but I would often hang out and hang out with people there. And a couple hours later, the market would be back to the way it was before the police came. I think this partially shows the pure desperation of people in their poverty. They had no choice but to sell these markets, these goods in the street. And it didn't matter if the police came, they had to support and feed their families. Um, but on the other hand, I think it also showed the spirit of the Uyghur people and saying, like, no, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and you can try to tell us what to do. But they really did find spaces and ways to be themselves, whether that meant wearing a headscarf, selling things in the market, or their own religious practices. It wasn't it wasn't total blanket control. There were definitely spaces for this kind of symbolic resistance. And this was also in the home. Celebrations like this one, um, you can see these are girde, um, which some people say were the first bagel. I think I also remember Cindy McNulty showing us pictures of those from her travels in Xinjiang when I was in high school, being like, these were the first bagels, guys. This is where bagels come from. Um, but, you know, and eating some fresh yogurt and other kinds of traditional soup. Um, and this picture was actually taken after the death of this family's mother um, who had cancer. And so you can't see it from this picture, but they're all wearing white or black headscarves um, in mourning for their mother, even though at the time that this picture was taken, that was actually strictly prohibited to wear a black or a white headscarf. Um, if you notice, a lot of the headscarves are color colorful because that's not as Islamic. Like a pure black or a pure white headscarf is considered more, more extreme. <laughs> in the view of the state. So those were more controversial. But this family did it anyway. They were like, we're going to mourn our, the death of our mother and we, we really don't care what anyone says. And so there were these spaces in the home of family and of community that still existed even, even in the oppression. But in 2017, things actually changed dramatically for the worse. And I mentioned that system, that database system, but um, it was, that database system started and it started really ramping up in 2016. The, the police stations started really ramping up in 2016, but the, the actual disappearances of people um, started in 2017. And so what had happened is nobody really knew what was going on. It was really confusing and scary. We didn't know why it was happening, but people were being sent to their hometowns. That's all we knew is 
I would get phone calls and text messages saying, Hey, like, I just want to let you know, I have to go home. I can't talk. I, I can't talk to you anymore. I can't see you anymore. Like, thank you for everything, but goodbye, basically. And this happened to many of my friends and people just started disappearing. And here are some of my friends that um, I spent a lot of time with. Um, and I don't know where they are. I don't know if I'll ever see them again. And I, I don't know, but they, they disappeared for no other reason other than their ethnicity. So we have satellite images. This is a one from the BBC that I recommend you checking out. It's a very visual, interactive, uh, interactive exhibit that shows some of the satellite images from from Xinjiang. And yeah, <laughs> that's all I can say is we have these satellite images that show very clearly. Um, large camps have been set up uh, for approximately one to three million Uyghur people. So this is the propaganda, right? These people are being punished for violent terrorist crimes. Um, and here's a headline, what's the goal? Transformation to make them part of the Chinese nation state. Why? Because they're poor, they're Muslim, and they're different. And because of their difference, they are categorized and systematically detained and tried to make into a vision of a homogenous, of a unified nation state of China. So, my takeaway point for today, <laughs> through all of this, this journey that we have been on together, <laughs> is to say, when you look at a map of China, when you present a map of China to your students, understand that this map of China was drawn based on the legacy of colonization, based on the legacy of imperialism, and it does not reflect the reality of people on the ground. Some people might see a map more like this. Tibet, East Turkestan, which is the other word for Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia, or some people say Southern Mongolia. The point is to say that anytime we present a map to our students, especially, you know, in my opinion, a map of China, but really any map of any country around the world, understand that there's so much more, there's a complex layer that is underneath that map, a story of a people who have had their land taken away, perhaps. So just as an example, this is a map of California, and this is a map of all the indigenous people of California. I mean, this is a map of the, of the indigenous territories of California. So this looks very different than a map of California that we might normally see, but this is the kind of message that we can give to our students to say, hey, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot. And it, a lot of it has to do with um, these categories of racial difference, whether it's indigenous, whether it's race, um, but there's a complex history in every, every people and every place. So to go back to that beginning slide, this is the image that's portrayed of Xinjiang, of a dangerous place of racial killings and heavy handed policing. But there's so much more to the story. And um, I think that Xinjiang has a lot to teach us about silencing minorities and about how we can listen. The best thing we can do is listen to the stories of the people who are living in these places. So before we stereotype a place or a people as dangerous, let's understand the human, the humanity behind that stereotype and 
if we can if we can listen to the human stories behind those dangerous people and places we can learn not to stereotype but rather create a more peaceful and inclusive world that is big enough for everyone so you might be wondering so what can i bring back to my students so just to kind of wrap up my i guess some of the things that you can bring back to your curriculum teach different meanings of maps and borders explain the link between ethnicity nation and genocide i haven't used the word genocide yet but understanding this is this is what is behind a lot of these systematic elimination of people whether it's native americans or Uyghurs, it comes down to this idea of a of a unified nation state and the elimination of people who don't fit into the vision of that nation state according to the people in power you can demonstrate the link between poverty categorical differences and incarceration what i mean by that is Muslims in China are targeted because they are poor. And it's not like they're poor just because they're poor. They're poor based on a history of colonization, but also a different definition of wealth. They are so rich in, in other aspects, but because of material wealth, they are targeted because of their unemployment. And they, as a result, they're seen as a danger to the state. And it's, it's the same in our own country. You can emphasize to your students the harmful effects of Islamophobia and communicate the damaging harms of stereotyping. Um, this is just a really quick, this is a, um, a campaign that I am working on and that you can go to the website and learn more about it. But um, this was my professor in Xinjiang and I'm working with her daughter to free her from the concentration camps. So I do have a list of further reading here, if you're interested. Um, I picked out some articles that I think would be suitable for a high school reader. And then the last two are books. So you can check them out when you get to PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, I think it's time for questions. This is just some you you're, you're welcome to email me or check out my website. And then I have uh, three links to um, two articles that I wrote myself and then one article about my research if, if you're interested in sharing with your students or reading more. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we'll turn it over to questions. So Lynn, should I stop the share now? Um, or you, if you want, or you can leave the resources up um, either way, whatever you prefer. Um, and first, let me thank you for this great presentation. Um, and we had very Was the lawnmower really bad? No, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> it wasn't too bad? Okay. Um, and we, um, we did have some um, notes going up in the chat saying, thank you, and the photos were great. Um, and your teacher, Cindy McNulty, said she was here to learn from you. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to invite people again to please um, share some questions if you have some. Um, we already have a few, so I'll start with uh, the first one from Orly, who was really curious about that photo that you had more towards the beginning that showed the diversity of the city. And she was curious about the extent to which other people outside China may feel a cultural affinity with people in, the, in this community, in the city, and if they attempt to assist and kind of to help the population there and what, how does the state react? Okay, so, okay, I think I understand the question. The question is like, do Uzbeks and Kyrgyz and Kazakhs kind of find a cultural affinity with the Uyghur people and then maybe try to help them with like resistance and if the police like target them as well? Is that kind of the question? Oh. Yes, or how, you know, okay. how does the state react to that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, yeah, so any foreigner was targeted as a potential threat to the Chinese state because as a foreigner, you're bringing in outside information about the world. And so 
Um, and, and this was including Americans um, because they felt kind of, when I say that, I mean the Chinese government kind of felt threatened by the American presence just because we have a different narrative about what freedom means. And so, and then if you were a foreigner who was also a Muslim, whether you were from Pakistan, because there were a lot of Pakistanis there too, whether you were Pakistan, Pakistani or from Malaysia, um, or even Saudi Arabia, if you were Muslim, you would be probably even more scrutinized. And then the Turkic, the people from Turkic countries um, were probably also under, at first, at first they were, all of these foreigners were allowed in and it was fine. And there was definitely some sense of community. But as the arrests started ramping up, then people from other countries were um, were definitely targeted. And eventually, in 2018, all foreigners, Americans, et cetera, were, were um, not allowed to live in Xinjiang anymore. So everyone was kicked out. Um, there is a scholar named Sean Roberts uh, who works at George Washington University. And he's written a little bit more about this because he specifically studied Uyghurs in Kazakhstan. And he, he, he looked more at the relationship between Uyghurs across the border and how there was kind of this sense of solidarity with the Muslims and as well as the Turkic community that kind of assisted in the resistance, at least during the 1990s. Um, there was this sense of solidarity with the Uyghurs, especially because that was around the time when the Soviet Union was breaking up. And so there was this sense that like, oh, we might be able to have a Uyghur son. Um, but that kind of quickly fell away. And um, yeah, so it's kind of complex, but that's, that's basically what I know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one other question we had is, um, because you talked a lot about poverty in your presentation. So um, kind of what definition of poverty are you using? Is it a poverty that's coming from the Chinese state? How would the Chinese state define poverty? And what were the, demogra the demographics in the city? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think poverty can be measured in so many different ways. Um, and when I say, and in terms of the city and the demographics, it was incredibly unequal. So there were lots of really wealthy Uyghurs and there were lots of really poor Uyghurs. And when I say that, I am using a somewhat reductionist language there um, to kind of generally categorize um, what I saw on the ground. So it's not what I'm speaking to is not coming from any type of statistic or tracking method, partially because I don't trust the Chinese statistics. Um, but I, I just don't think they're accurate. And it's also impossible to track that kind of thing because migrants are so often not registered and just completely under the radar because they're subject to this kind of government and bureaucratic microscope. So a lot of people just kind of, they are, um, you know, they're, they're completely under the radar. So, um, so what, when I say that, what I mean is what I witnessed in terms of material comfort, which was often maybe, it could be usually 12 to 15 people in a one room apartment, um, no running water, um, no access to sewage. So a lot of people didn't even have toilets in their homes. They had to go, they had to leave their home for a public restroom. Um, they did not have heating in their homes. So a lot of them burned coal in their homes and they had like very rudimentary ways of filtering the smoke out. And it was actually quite smoky and toxic inside their homes as they were burning coal to heat their homes, um, not really having money for food beyond bread and rice, um, things like that. So that's what I saw and that's what I mean when I say that. 
Thank you. Um, another question that came is um, about your work. So how has the Chinese government reacted to your work, and um, this is from Christopher, in the US in regards to the Uyghur people? So is China limiting your access um, to the country? Um, by the way, my roommate is playing something in the background. Can you hear it at all? No. No. Okay. So, um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I have not had any communication with the government since I left and, um, I have not engaged in any dialogue with government officials or anything like that. So, I have no idea. I have not tried to go back since 2017, um, and the future of that remains to be seen. I haven't gotten any threatening messages or anything like that. Um, haven't gotten any death threats or any kind of emails or anything like that. So um, I'm not really sure. Um, I try to walk the fine line between being an advocate for human rights rights that I believe in because I believe that this is um, one of the worst human rights crises since World War II and I believe that the world needs to know about it so I have chosen to sp speak out as much as I can but I don't engage in lots of government advocacy work I do more awareness and writing um, about the stories of the people I knew um, but I haven't done any major work with the State Department or Congress or anything like that. I've, I've written letters and I've had people write letters to the State Department, but um, in terms of public appearances, I haven't done too much of that. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Natalie who is wondering um, if um, kind of the more intense um, presence of the state has driven religious practices underground. I mean, you had a photo of a mosque. Um, so there's always been a tense relationship there, um, but she was curious about how that was developing. Yeah, so I don't know what it's like now, but at least when I was there, um, it was like a gradual elimination of religion. And so, there was a gradual escalation of not being allowed to do religious things. When I first went there, people, people would pray on the streets. People prayed in restaurants, like whenever there was a call to prayer, there was called a prayer. There were people going to mosque every Friday. I mean, the mosques were packed. Um, people fasting during Ramadan. Um, all of those things were very visible. And then as time went on and the state started cracking down, they became more and more um, hidden and secretive to the point where people didn't even say Assalamu alaikum anymore. Um, people stopped. Assalamu alaikum is like a common um, greeting just to say hello. It, it means um, God's peace be with you, but it, it's just a common greeting in, in the Muslim world. And even that was became unheard of so um but i definitely think that i wasn't necessarily a witness to it but i definitely think that people continued their faith in a secret secret way thank you um greg said that um he was surprised to hear you say that the Uyghurs were tar targeted for their poverty um his sense was that the chinese were using um the excuse that um the reason that they were targeted was because of um, nationalism, that the Uyghurs were said to be Islamic terrorists. Um, so what um, kind of um, moments of that did you see, or because you spoke a lot about the, them being targeted because they were poor? Yeah, okay, so this is a great question. Thank you so much for this question. Okay, so first of all, Yes, they are targeted because of Islamophobia, because of terrorism, these kinds of things. However, part of the, the other part of the rhetoric around these concentration camps are that they're re-education schools to help the Uyghurs gain skills in order to get jobs. 
So that's part of the rhetoric too, is that, oh, they're backward, they're uneducated, so we're going to help them. We're going to bring civilization to them by teaching them these skills so that they can work in our factories, basically. So that's part of it. And there is a lot of evidence of people graduating from the camps and being moved to factories, even being moved to factories in Eastern China. So it's very clear to me that they are cultivating a slave labor force in these camps. Now, in terms of them being targeted because they're poor, what I mean by that is in the city in particular, which is the only place I was there to do research. I did travel in the rural areas, but only for traveling purposes. And I didn't conduct research in those areas. I didn't have, I didn't have permission to do that. I did have permission to conduct research in the city. Um, in the city, there were um, very large and visible numbers of unemployed people. And it was very um, clear that people didn't have work. That was part of the interviews that I conducted why did you move here and how how is your life in the city well I moved to the city to find work and I couldn't find any people were saying over and over again pull top all my men which means I can't make money <laughs> I'm not making any money like people were getting desperate and agree with me or not, like in the United States, when you have a, a large number of unemployed people, especially unemployed men, um, we've seen in our own country mass incarceration results. Why? Because um, the, th the state feels threatened by a large number, number of people who aren't being occupied by the capitalist system. So that's kind of my own, my own theory, which is based on Jordan Camp and other scholars um, who have used um, structural theory to understand the ways that economics really plays into mass incarceration. Um, so it's a great book, um, Jordan Camp, um, which is called Incarcerating the Crisis, published in 2016. So you can check that out. That's where I got the theory from. Um, but it seemed to me like the, the Chinese state and the government officials were very aware of the fact that there was an economic crisis happening, not only in Eastern China, but in Western China as well. As we know, GDP in China has been decreasing steadily over the last um, number of years. And they were worried about an economic crisis happening and they saw an opportunity to um, incarcerate people before there were more problems. Thanks. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll um, try a couple of more. Okay, uh, we were talking, Lynn, that if people have additional questions that aren't answered, they can email me just yes. to respect people's time. Yes, absolutely. And you all see um, Sarah Tynan's email right there on the, um, the slide that's still showing. Um, so one question from Maria is that when new residents register in the city, do they have to report if they're Muslim or not, or a different religion? Um, and do Muslims receive the same or different treatments in other parts of China? So if you're a Muslim living in Shanghai, for example, or in other rural parts of China? Yeah, that's a great question. There are, whenever you register, you have to report your ethnicity. And in China, your ethnicity is tied to your religion, including Muslims. So what that means is um, there are some Chinese people who are Chinese in every way, but they're Muslim and they are categorized as a different ethnicity. They do also have to report on their forms what ethnicity they are. And in fact, for, for Chinese people, this is as mundane as reporting your gender because this is on your identity card. Your ethnicity is on your identity card. So it's, for them, it's like, yeah, female, Uyghur, Hui, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of just a given. And, and the state has, you know, a database of everyone's ethnicity. So even if you didn't report it, it would be connected to your name. Um, so there are 10 ethnicities in China that are Muslim. Um, 
And so if you were one of those 10 ethnicities, you, they would know automatically that you were Muslim. So you can kind of think of it as similar to being categorized as Jewish in that not everyone, not every Uyghur is necessarily religious, but they still identify at least as the cultural Muslim and as such are categorized ethnically for that. So, um, so yes, they did have to report that. And yes, um, so in this case, it wasn't that they were like, oh, all Muslims um, have to do this special thing, but they did have a clear policy that all minorities had to do this special registration process. And in Xinjiang, all minor most minorities are Muslim including Kazakhs, and um, that's in the title of this presentation, but I didn't get to that part. <laughs> um, so if you were Uzbek, Kazakh, Uyghur, um, Kyrgyz, um, any of those Muslim groups, then you were also subject. The Chinese Muslims, it's a little bit tricky. Um, that might be a, a question for another day, but, um, but yes. And then in terms of other cities in China, so it kind of varied Sometimes in Eastern China, Uyghurs were treated even worse. Sometimes they weren't even allowed to stay in hotels in Eastern China. I mean, they were targeted in an even more scrutinous way when they went to Eastern China. Um, in some cases, um, Hui Muslims particularly live in perfectly peaceful ways and totally are fine in Eastern China. So it kind of depends on the situation. And in some Uyghurs did live in Beijing. I think Beijing has a Uyghur population of 10,000 or so. So there's definitely some, some Uyghurs that, that move to eastern China. So it kind of, it kind of depends. Um, we can actually maybe finish with one last question. Um, and is it, what is your sense of um, the general Han understanding of what's happening in Xinjiang? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I did have one chapter of my dissertation dedicated to the Han because I also speak Chinese and I did spend a lot of time interviewing and working with Han people while I was there. It really varied. Um, it was quite shocking. Um, there were some Han people who um, did not agree agree with the state policies that were happening. There were Han people who said, you know, I feel a lot safer. I'm really glad that there's more police around. I feel like they're really making the city better. You know, they're cracking down on the Luan, <laughs> the chaos. Um, they're really cleaning it up. I feel a lot better with this. You know, now that the Uyghurs are disappearing, I feel like you know, the city is better and things like that. So there was some of that for sure. There was definitely some racism. Um, let's see, definitely some discrimination, but um, there were also some, um, some people who really disagreed with what was happening saying, you know, this is really negatively affecting my business um, to have all these people suddenly incarcerated. I don't have as many people um, coming to my business, you know, my business is suffering because of this. So there was kind of a wide range perspective. I would say overall, the general perspective from Han Chinese people is that we deserve to be here. This is our country too. And all we're doing is looking for economic opportunities ourselves. We're, we have also been the victim of state violence, we have also been the victim of capitalism and we couldn't find work in Eastern China. So we came out here to find work because we had to feed our families. So they, they also have a complex narrative of, of oppression of their own that is part of the story as well. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank everyone, all the participants um, who joined us for this webinar. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Tynan, for educating us on the situation in Xinjiang in um, China. And um, 
the PowerPoint will be available. So we will be able to share that. So on behalf of TEA, I want to thank everyone. Um, stay safe, stay home, and be healthy. And we hope that um, school for all these teachers will resume at some point in the fall. So again, thank you all. And again, Dr. Tynan, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And I'll send you the PowerPoint right now because I revised it slightly. So I'll send you the PowerPoint right now and then you'll send it out to everyone so they can get the links. Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. That's awesome. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Please feel free to email me any questions.